Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. This is the frustrating case of Molly Tibbetts, a case that brings to light the subjects of infidelity, of immigration, and the greatest loss that any parent could ever face. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with at least two new videos every week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Molly. On May the 8th, 1998, in San Francisco, California, Molly Tibbetts, the daughter of Robert and Laura, was born. Although born in San Francisco, she moved to Brooklyn, Iowa. There she attended the BGM High School, where she graduated with her class in 2017. Following high school, she became a psychology major at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Molly enjoyed life. Her enthusiasm for living was evident in her contagious smile, a smile that she was always ready to share with anyone that she encountered. She excelled at writing and speaking, sharing her opinions on a variety of challenging and complex topics, including mental health and self-esteem. Her abilities were recognised when she received three years of invitations to perform at the Iowa All-State competition. She fell in love with theatre after her first performance in a musical and cherished participating in school productions. In cross-country running, Molly pushed herself and incorporated running into her daily routine. She also had a great passion for children. Children loved her ability to make them laugh and the way that she made them feel loved. She enrolled at the University of Iowa to pursue a career as a child psychologist so that she could assist young people with mental health problems. She also enjoyed participating in choir, in dance marathons and singing. She excelled in finding new friends wherever she went. She started babysitting at a young age, where her love of children grew. In 2016, she started working a summer job at the GRMC day camp in Brooklyn, Iowa. By Thursday, July the 19th, 2018, Molly was 20 years old. Very unlike Molly, she didn't turn up to her job at the day camp, something that wasn't at all typical. Her boyfriend Dalton Jack realised she wasn't at work he tried calling her many times but got no response. Calls from him went directly to voicemail. Messages went unread. A stark realisation soon came to light. Neither her friends or family had seen or heard from her that entire day. She was then reported missing by Dalton to the police. Dalton claimed that as far as he knew, Molly was alone the night before, and that was the last time he heard from her. She was actually a guest at his home, a home he shared in Brooklyn, Iowa with his brother, Blake Jack. Dalton explained to the police that Molly had stayed at their house so that she could take care of their pets. Meanwhile, he and his brother were out of town for a week of business. Police narrowed down the last sighting of Molly to be on the 18th of July. Dalton claimed that he watched a movie by himself in his hotel room that evening. And whilst he was there, a Snapchat message received at 10.30pm was his final interaction with Molly. Police started looking for her after learning that she had gone for a run on July the 18th on a country road just outside of Brooklyn. Christina Stewart, a local woman, spoke with the police. She claimed to have known Molly and to have seen her running at 7.45pm that day. When Christina drove past her, she knew it was Molly because it was someone that she already knew. There was no mistake. Police were now prompted to search the neighbourhood for security cameras. Numerous volunteers, close friends, family members and law enforcement agencies looked for Molly for weeks, searching anywhere they believed she may be. Family, friends, and members of the Brooklyn community all came out in full force to look for Molly. We just really hope that we can get her found and brought back home to the yeah. people that love her. She's someone many volunteers and family alike describe as friendly and energetic. She is uh, about to start her sophomore year at the University of Iowa. She is um, probably about 5'2", brown hair, brown eyes, beautiful smile, um, great with kids. Catherine Metz and her friends say they've known Molly since high school. It's really scary. Um, like now I wouldn't want to go out by myself really. <laughs> um, I'm just really hoping we find her. 
Her disappearance leaving many on edge. Friends say it's very unlike her to disappear like this. I'm feeling kind of scared and nervous and I'm anxious, hoping we can find her today. You know, you wouldn't think that something like this would happen in the small town of Brooklyn. Authorities say they've been looking all over town. So far we've been searching uh, by air and foot both. But focus the majority of Friday's efforts on the fields between her house and where she was staying when she disappeared. Family says Molly spent Wednesday night dog sitting. These fields, a typical trail for the avid jogger. Early in the day, crews tried searching with helicopters, but weather wasn't in their favor. As far as the air patrols go, because of the low cloud ceiling, uh, they're not able to get certain aircraft up with uh, the technology that we need. Police finally obtained CCTV footage of Molly running. They now made progress in the investigation. The video showed cars passing Molly as she ran, but one truck stuck out because it circled back and passed her once more. The individual driving the truck was recognized by the police. He was. Christian Bahina Riviera. He had been working under an alias at Yoruba Farms, a nearby dairy farm, for four years as an undocumented immigrant from Mexico. He was captured on the CCTV footage of a house passing Molly in his Chevy Malibu. Christian was questioned by the police. After being questioned for hours, Christian eventually revealed that he had seen Molly that day despite his original denials. We've set up a Bring Molly Tibbetts Home Safe reward fund at First State Bank here in Brooklyn, Iowa. We believe that Molly is still alive and if someone has abducted her, we are pleading with you to please release her. We are partnering with Crime Stoppers of Central Iowa to help facilitate the process of receiving information anonymously. That we can use to pay for her release or information that would lead to her location. As of 10 o'clock this morning, uh, we have raised $172,000 that will be paid to you as soon as Molly is safely home. It is our greatest hope that if someone has her, that they would just release her and claim that money that we have raised for her freedom. He claimed to a circle back after seeing Molly running while he was driving because he thought she was attractive. The likelihood of finding Molly alive was diminishing. As the interrogation continued, Christian said that he exited the car and went up to Molly. He then followed her as she ran and Molly yelled at him to leave her alone or she would be forced to call the police. He became furious due to this rejection, so furious that he claims he blacked out. He and Molly were both inside his truck when he came to from his blackout, but Molly was now no longer breathing. Christian drove her body to a cornfield in Brooklyn and buried her. Police were guided by Christian to the location of Molly's shallow grave. When they arrived, they noticed her running shoes. She had leaves and stalks from the cornfield all over her body. Molly had been jabbed with a sharp object multiple times, as indicated by an autopsy. Christian was charged with first degree murder. He entered a not guilty plea despite having shown police where Molly's body was hidden, not forgetting that he admitted to harassing her and having her in his truck. At the trial, prosecution argued that no one else was involved in the crime and that only Christian was to blame for Molly's passing. In court, the jury was informed that the prosecution's case would be supported by three key arguments. A security camera that showed Molly running as Christian's truck sped past her. Statements that Christian made to the police, including the fact that he showed them where Molly's body was hidden. And the damning fact that Molly's DNA was discovered in his truck. Prosecutor Bart Claver told the court that given all the available evidence, there was no other reasonable explanation and Christian was guilty. The court was informed that Molly left for a run on July the 18th and did not come home. Instead, a month after she was reported missing, her heavily degraded remains were discovered because Christian led them there. Dalton Jack, Molly's boyfriend, gave a statement in court. He expressed his sorrow for her passing. He described Molly as a cheerful, vivacious and funny young lady. He said before the court that Molly went for a run almost every day. Dalton testified that they had been dating for three years and that he had been out of town for work on the day that she vanished. 
He claimed in court that he had worked on a team that erected a bridge about 140 miles from Brooklyn. The day Molly was last seen alive, according to testimony given in court, he worked a 12-hour shift before going out with the rest of his crew to drink and play games. He told the court that he stayed in a hotel that night instead of going back to Brooklyn. Dalton had a solid alibi. The prosecution informed the court that when Christian was apprehended, he confessed to the police that he drove past Molly and then drove past her again because he thought she was attractive. He then got out of his truck and ran alongside her, but Molly threatened to call the police, something which enraged him. After a struggle, he blacked out. The next thing he remembered was driving and finding her body inside of his truck. The court was informed that he drove to the cornfield, carried her to the location and then buried her. The prosecution informed the jury that they thought there was a sexual motive involved in the attack. When she was discovered in the cornfield, she was wearing only socks and a sports bra. Her legs were parted. Molly's injuries were disclosed to the jury. She had between 7 and 12 injuries made by a sharp object and that she had passed as the result of a blunt force. The prosecution's additional DNA evidence against Christian was presented to the court. The DNA of Molly was discovered in Christian's truck. Blood stains on the truck's rubber trunk seal and trunk liner were found to contain Molly's DNA. The prosecution urged the jury to fully study the evidence because, if they did, there would be no room for doubt regarding Christian's guilt. The defence obviously disagreed with this. They described him as a devout Christian immigrant who entered the country illegally as a teenager in search of a better life. His attorney told the court that the police had closed Molly's case to quickly and that both Christian and his family deserved justice. The defence claimed that Christian was coerced into confessing falsely. She characterised her client as a helpful person who always followed instructions. She testified to the jury that the police interrogated him after he had just finished a 12-hour shift and broke him down over the course of many hours. They said that the interrogation persisted until it was suggested to Christian that, that maybe you just blacked out telling the jury that his confession was false and pressured. The defence then made an effort to implicate boyfriend Dalton. They informed the jury that Dalton was anything but the ideal partner and actually had a short fuse. On the witness stand, Dalton acknowledged that he occasionally lost his temper and did get into altercations. Additionally, the defence informed the jury that Dalton wasn't a faithful boyfriend. Dalton said in court that he had cheated on Molly and he had up. He said that Molly learned of his infidelity when she went through his phone's messages and she discovered the truth. Dalton though asserted that they had overcome it and had moved on. However, further questioning by the defence revealed that Molly was still upset about it three days prior to going missing and the day before she was last seen alive she brought it up once again. Dalton was now shown his phone records by the defence. He confirmed that the Snapchat that Molly sent him at 10.30pm was his final contact with her. But in reality, a Snapchat message was actually received at around 1am. However, he vehemently denied any involvement in Molly's passing. For now, Dalton was absolved. Christian admitted to the court that he didn't tell the truth when he described what had transpired to the police. This was out of fear for the safety of his ex-partner and their young child. He claimed to the court that two other individuals were accountable for Molly's passing and not him. He claimed that on July the 18th, while he was in the shower, two men entered the trailer where he lives. These individuals were strangers to him. They had masks on. One man held a firearm while the other carried a knife. Christian testified that they fought forced him to drive to the country road just outside of Brooklyn to the location where Molly was. According to Christian's testimony, one of the men ended Molly and then placed her body inside of his truck. After that, they gave him instructions on how to dispose of the body. They then allegedly threatened him, according to Christian. He was warned to keep quiet or his daughter and ex-girlfriend would also be ended. He stated that's why, rather than telling the police the truth, he told them that he approached Molly and then blacked out. Forensic expert Michael Spence was called by the defence to testify regarding the DNA discovered in Christian's truck. Although he testified that more DNA was discovered, including that of at least one unknown male and a female, he concurred that Molly's DNA 
DNA was found on bloodstains in the trunk. The mother of Christian's daughter gave testimony. She identified herself as Iris Gamboa and stated that she had lived with Christian for four years. The couple split up in 2017, but she said he was a good dad who gave their daughter $500 a month in child support and that he also sent money to his parents in Mexico so they could build a new house. She told the court that he had never shown excessive anger or used violence against her. It was now down to the jury. And I would ask that the court attendant read the jury's verdict. We the jury find the defendant, Christian Bejina Rivera, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Thank you, Carrie. You may be seated, please. After seven hours of deliberation, the jury found Christian guilty of first degree murder. You and you alone impacted the lives of people who loved Molly Tibbers. Judge Joel Yates declared to Christian in court. If you have anything to say for yourself, if you have anything to say for yourself, are you sorry? Since Iowa did not have the death penalty, Christian was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Can you imagine, Mr. Rivera, as a father, having Paulina's mother taken away from you and to have to tell your daughter that she will never come home? However, the most difficult person to tell was Molly's grandmother and my mother, Judy Calderwood. Judy truly believed her granddaughter would be found alive because who could harm such a beautiful, vibrant young woman so full of life and promise? Who could harm Judy's precious granddaughter, let alone brutally murder her and dump her body in a cornfield? This was heartbreaking news that needed to be delivered in person. I entered my mother's home and she greeted me with a big smile and asked if I wanted a cup of coffee. There certainly was no easy way to tell her the news. However, it had to be done before her phone started ringing with loved ones sending their condolences. I very quietly and softly said, Mom, I have some bad news. They found Molly's body this morning but we know where she is now. Christian was also ordered to give the Tibbetts family $150,000 in restitution as part of the penalty. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? Let me know down in the comments. Join the Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications for at least two new videos every week. Like the video to boost the signal of this case. Thank you to all my patrons, Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palneri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, and Mona Corona. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.